Let's now read from Daniel 1, Daniel 4 rather, verse 1 through verse 22. That's Daniel 4, verses 1 through 22. Nebuchadnezzar the king, unto all people, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth, peace be multiplied unto you. I thought it good to show the signs and wonders that the high God hath wrought toward me. How great are his signs and how mighty are his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and his dominion is from generation to generation. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at rest in mine house and flourishing in my palace. I saw a dream which made me afraid. The thoughts upon my bed and the visions of my head troubled me. Therefore made I a decree to bring in all the wise men of Babylon before me, that they might make known unto me the interpretation of the dream. Then came in the magicians, the astrologers, the Chaldeans, and the soothsayers, and I told the dream before them, but they did not make known unto me the interpretation thereof. But at the last, Daniel came in before me, whose name was Belteshazzar, according to the name of my God, and in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. And before him I told the dream, saying, I, O Belteshazzar, master of the magicians, because I know that the spirit of the holy gods is in thee, and no secret troubleth thee, tell me the visions of my dream that I have seen and the interpretation thereof. Thus were the visions of mine head in my bed, I saw and behold a tree in the midst of the earth, and the height thereof was great. The tree grew and was strong, and the height thereof reached unto heaven, and the sight thereof to the end of all the earth. The leaves thereof were fair, and the fruit thereof much, and in it was meat for all. The beasts of the field had shadow under it, and the fowls of the heaven dwelt in the boughs thereof, and all flesh was fed of it. I saw in the visions of my head upon my bed, and behold, a watcher and a holy one came down from heaven. He cried aloud and said thus, Hew down the tree, Cut off his branches, shake off his leaves, and scatter his fruit. Let the beasts get away from under it, and the fowls from his branches. Nevertheless, leave the stump of his roots in the earth, even with a band of iron and brass, in the tender grass of the field. And let it be wet with the dew of heaven, and let his portion be with the beasts in the grass of the earth. Let his heart be changed from man's, and let a beast's heart be given unto him, and let seven times pass over him. This matter is by the decree of the watchers, and the demand by the word of the holy ones, to the intent that the living may know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men, and giveth it to whomsoever he will and setteth up over it the basest of men. This dream I, King Nebuchadnezzar, have seen. Now thou, O Belteshazzar, declare the interpretation thereof, for as much as all the wise men of my kingdom are not able to make known unto me the interpretation, but thou art able, for the spirit of the holy gods is in thee. Then Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, was astonished for one hour, and his thoughts troubled him. The king spake and said, Belteshazzar, let not the dream or the interpretation thereof trouble thee. Belteshazzar answered and said, My lord, the dream be to them that hate thee, and the interpretation thereof to thine enemies. The tree that thou sawest, which grew and was strong, whose height reached unto the heaven, and the sight thereof to all the earth, whose leaves were fair, and the fruit thereof much, and in it was meat for all, under which the beasts of the field dwelt, 
and upon whose branches the fowls of the heaven had their habitation, it is thou, O king, that are grown and become strong, for thy greatness has grown and reacheth unto heaven, and thy dominion to the end of the earth. Amen. Beloved, before we launch into Daniel 4, this being our first sermon on this amazing chapter, we should pause to take stock. What about the contents of the previous three chapters that we have looked at in some 12 sermons already? Daniel 1 has for its theme, one could say, cultural assimilation. The children of the Jewish nobility were to be made into good Babylonians embracing that pagan worldview. Such was the desire of Nebuchadnezzar and his imperial functionaries. They were going to achieve this by changing the names, the diets, and the education of these young men. So that at the end of the chain, they would come out pagans, pagan Babylonians like themselves. But some of them, these young Jewish men, remained faithful by God's grace to Jehovah and his word. In chapter 2, we move from cultural assimilation to the four kingdoms. Nebuchadnezzar dreamed of an awesome colossus made of four metals, gold, silver, and bronze. Remember the three medals in Olympic Games? That'll help fix it in your mind. Gold, silver, and bronze, and then iron. Representing, and I hope you have this straight too, Babylon, then the Medo-Persians, then the Greeks, and then, in the days of our Lord Jesus, both before and after, the Romans. Daniel 3 takes us to state idolatry. Nebuchadnezzar required all to worship his golden image on the plain of Dura. When the dulcimer, sackbut, psaltery, harp, and all the rest sounded, on pain of being cast bodily into the burning, fiery furnace. But Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego refused. The pre-incarnate Christ joined them in the furnace, and the three young men emerged from those superheated flames without even the smell of fire upon their garments. Now, all of this brings us to the godly characters in Daniel 1 through 3 and, for good measure, Daniel 4, this morning's chapter. In chapter 1, we have Daniel and his three friends proving faithful to God during their Babylonian schooling. In Daniel 2, we have Daniel again. He interprets Nebuchadnezzar's dream of the four-metal image, but he also prayed with his three friends beforehand and saw to it that they too gained promotion. So the first two chapters include all four of these godly Hebrews though especially Daniel. When you get to Daniel 3, Daniel 3 only treats the three friends. That's the narrative of the golden image and the fiery furnace. In Daniel 4, we have only Daniel. No references whatsoever to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And by the way, Daniel 1 through 4, those chapters are the only four chapters in the book in which Nebuchadnezzar occurs as a living, acting character. His name is mentioned in chapter 5 and chapter 7, for instance, but by that stage, he's already dead. Nebuchadnezzar examines the Jewish students, chapter 1. Nebuchadnezzar dreams of the great human image, chapter 2. Nebuchadnezzar dedicates the golden image, Chapter 3. 
And Nebuchadnezzar dreams of the great tree in chapter 4. Now notice a couple of things about these four chapters in connection with Nebuchadnezzar. First of all, Nebuchadnezzar actually has two revelatory dreams. Chapter 2, he dreams of the four world images, the four world empires, excuse me. In chapter 4, he dreams, as we shall see later, of himself. Two revelatory dreams. It's worth mentioning, secondly, that Nebuchadnezzar, as a character, becomes more involved. From chapter 1 to chapter 2 to chapter 3 to chapter 4. And so a clearer image of him as an individual emerges as one moves through the opening four chapters of Daniel. And now we're ready to mention two striking things about Daniel 4, both of which mark this chapter as completely unique in Holy Scripture. Here's the first one. Daniel 4 is narrated by Nebuchadnezzar. Listen again, with that in mind, to these verses. Verse 1. Nebuchadnezzar, the king, is writing to all people, nations and languages that dwell on the earth. Peace be multiplied unto you from Nebuchadnezzar. Verse 2. I, Nebuchadnezzar, thought it good to show the signs and wonders that the high God hath wrought towards me. First person. Nebuchadnezzar. Verse 4. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at rest in mine house and flourishing in my palace. And to move to near the end of this chapter, verse 34 reads, At the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up mine eyes unto heaven, and so forth. Now sometimes a chapter of scripture contains an official letter written by a civil or military leader in a pagan kingdom. You see that especially in Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther. You also have it in the book of Acts, where a military captain writes a letter. But here we have, in Daniel 4, a whole chapter of 37 verses, and they're not short verses either, containing a personal account of deep humiliation before God written by Nebuchadnezzar, a pagan, who was a type of the Antichrist. I say again, there's nothing like that found elsewhere in the Bible. And secondly, Daniel 4 contains a record of bow anthropy. Anthropy comes from the word anthropos for man. You're probably familiar with that. And bow from bovine, an adjective that means pertaining to cows or oxen. Bow anthropy, cow man, literally that's what the word means. Bow anthropy is a psychological disorder in which a person believes himself or herself to be an ox or a cow, a bovine. And there's nothing else like this in Scripture, where Nebuchadnezzar here goes crazy, mental, insane, and believes himself to be an ox eating grass. Daniel 4, then, is unique for these two reasons. It's a personal account, the whole chapter, a personal account written by a type of the Antichrist, found in the Bible of all places. And in it, secondly, this type of the Antichrist, writing personally, 
describes himself as suffering from boanthropy, believing himself to be an ox. This was prophesied in the dream, and this was fulfilled. But now, of course, we can't cover all this in one sermon on Daniel 4, especially Nebuchadnezzar's boanthropy. That must wait in its entirety, Lord willing, to a later day. But this long chapter, we need an overview of it. So it's a little bit more familiar to you. The first three verses is a blessing from Nebuchadnezzar. An introductory blessing. He praises God and wishes peace on his readers. Verses 4 through 9 tell us about how Nebuchadnezzar had a dream and he sought its interpretation. In Daniel 4, 10 through 18, that Nebuchadnezzar relates his dream to Daniel. And verses 19 through 27, Daniel interprets the dream. 28 through 33, the fulfillment of the dream. And then again we have Nebuchadnezzar's blessing of God Verses 34 to the end. So at the start and the end, we have a blessing. In the very middle, the dream is related and interpreted. And then we have a little bit of narrative between the blessing and the interpretation and the dream. And a little bit of narrative then between that and the final concluding blessing. Hopefully that gives you some sort of an idea of the contents. This then raises the question, how are we going to break this down, this one unit narrative from one perspective, to make it manageable so that we can cope with an identifiable part in one sermon without just skating over lightly and treating the whole thing in one chapter where the sermon doesn't go that much deeper than what you already knew before the sermon started. Well, what I plan to do here is to exclude the fulfillment of the dream. A later sermon will deal with that in the will of God. We're going to exclude even that part of the dream and its interpretation, which prophesies of Nebuchadnezzar's abasement when he thinks himself an ox. Later, in a different sermon, in the will of God. And we're going to exclude the blessings at the very start of the chapter and at the very end of the chapter. So today then, we're going to deal with the first half of the chapter, more or less, actually a bit less. We're going to cover that part of the dream that deals with the tree and the events that lead up to the part of the dream that deals with the tree and what the tree means. That is... Daniel 4, verses 4 through 12, and then 20 through 22. Let's look together at Nebuchadnezzar's dream of the great tree. Asking and answering these three simple questions. When did he receive it? Chiefly, verse 4. What immediately followed? Verses 5 through 9. And then what was its meaning? Verse 10 through 12, when Nebuchadnezzar relates it. And verses 20 through 22, when Daniel interprets that part. That's Nebuchadnezzar's dream of the great tree. When did he receive it? What immediately followed? And what was its message? The question then is, when, during his 43-year reign, did Nebuchadnezzar receive this dream? Let's narrow it down. It came, first of all, after the events recorded in chapters 1 through 3, the events I've already mentioned. It came also when his building projects, or at least his major building projects, in Babylon were all, or almost all, completed. I say that because of verse 30. The king spake and said, Is 
not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of the kingdom by the might of my power and for the honour of my majesty. We could also say that this dream was given when Nebuchadnezzar was in relative peace. Verse 4, I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at rest in mine house. There were no wars raging around the boundaries of his kingdom, for example, with Egypt, or before that, Tyre and Zidon. And there were no insurrections within his empire. To continue verse 4, I was flourishing in my palace. So there he is personally prospering and doing very well. We know too, to try and identify when he received this dream, we know too that he received it before, obviously, the close of his 43 year reign at his death. There was evidently time for him to rule again after his boanthropy, insanity. And of course, going back a bit further, there was time for his insanity, which lasted, quote, seven times. Say more about that in a future sermon, Lord willing. And then, Verse 29 mentions 12 months after the dream and its interpretation, when the dream was fulfilled. Then he went insane. Then he recovered and was able to do a few things and then he died. In other words, the dream was given by God to Nebuchadnezzar somewhere in the second half of his 43 year reign, but not at the very end. It came after his building projects, or at least most of them, or at least most of them in Babylon were completed or almost completed. After the establishment of his realm with the war against Egypt, for instance, being finished, but yet before the other things I mentioned, and when certain conditions obtained, peace and prosperity. Can we say anything more about Nebuchadnezzar's subjective state of mind when he received this dream. You will remember, those of you who have been following this series on Daniel, you will remember that with regard to his first dream in Daniel 2, we have these words, Daniel 2 verse 29. As for thee, O king, thy thoughts came into thy mind upon thy bed, what should come to pass hereafter? And many reckon, and the original Aramaic points this way more than our English translation, that Nebuchadnezzar went to bed thinking about the future. And then God gave him the dream about these four great kingdoms and the far greater kingdom, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ, the kingdom of grace. One wonders regarding Nebuchadnezzar's second dream, the one in chapter 4, if something similar isn't happening. Verse 4 says, I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at rest in mine house and flourishing in my palace. That suggests in itself, along with the analogy from chapter 2, that Nebuchadnezzar, who remember is an ungodly man, and who has all this prosperity and peace, it suggests a certain self-satisfaction abiding in his own heart. And then God gives him this dream about the tree. Now that tree's going to be cut down. And how... He's going to be turned mentally into an ox. God humbles him, especially when he's feeling self-satisfied and proud. That's when it was fulfilled 
and even feeling that way when the dream was given, though to probably a slightly lesser extent. Let's sum up the first point of the sermon then. When did Nebuchadnezzar receive the dream? Later, during his over four decades sitting on the throne of the Babylonian Empire. And when things were going very well for him, and when, I suggest, he was feeling especially superior and maybe even smug. And you, and even the children, will understand that this is not a good way to feel self-satisfied, superior, smug. Not a good way to think about one's self. And God, Nebuchadnezzar realizes this too and confesses it at the end of the chapter, has a way of people, of bringing people like that and people who think like that, God has a way of bringing people like that down. And that's one of the lessons of Daniel 4. What immediately followed Nebuchadnezzar's having this dream is very similar to the sequence of events after Nebuchadnezzar's first revelatory dream in Daniel 2. This is true with regard to Nebuchadnezzar's emotions. Daniel 2 verse 1. In the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar dreamed dreams wherewith his spirit was troubled. Verse 3, the king says, I have dreamed a dream and my spirit was troubled to know the dream. He's troubled. He's troubled regarding the future. He's troubled regarding the future of his kingdom. Here's Daniel 4, verse 5. I saw a dream which made me afraid, and the thoughts upon my bed and the visions of my head troubled me. Troubled, mentioned in both chapters. Now chapter 4 mentions fear. He's afraid and troubled about himself. Chapter four, chapter two, probably more about his kingdom. After reading about Nebuchadnezzar's emotions in both chapters, we have Nebuchadnezzar's summons. Four verse six. Therefore, since I had a dream which troubled me and made me afraid, therefore made I a decree to bring in all the wise men of Babylon before me, that they might make known unto me the interpretation of the dream. That's just the same as happened in chapter 2, verse 2, with exactly the same four parties being mentioned, to quote verse 7, magicians, astrologers, Chaldeans, and soothsayers. Nebuchadnezzar's emotions after the dream. Nebuchadnezzar's summons of would-be interpreters and then Nebuchadnezzar's command. Chapter 2 was, number 1, relate the dream. Tell me what I dreamt. And, number 2, interpret the dream. In chapter 4, Daniel, or sorry, Nebuchadnezzar, only commands the wise men to interpret the dream. He's going to give them a helping hand this time. He will relate the dream to them. Now your job is to explain the meaning. Verse 6 says that they might make known unto me the interpretation of the dream. So, quote, I told the dream before them, but they did not make known unto me the interpretation thereof. The next part of the sacred narrative in Daniel 4 is similar to that in Daniel 2, but with some differences that befit the later circumstances. The magicians fail to interpret Nebuchadnezzar's dream. 
Chapter 4, verse 7 says that, as did chapter 2 before. But this time, the magicians, astrologers, sorcerers, and Chaldeans are not asked about it three times. Nebuchadnezzar doesn't get angry with them. And Nebuchadnezzar does not issue blood-curdling threats about dismembering them and turning their homes into dung hills. In both narratives, Daniel 2 and Daniel 4, Daniel then comes in. This time, unlike chapter 2, there's no Arioch sent out to slay him as belonging to the class of the wise men. And there's no need for Daniel to ask for more time from Nebuchadnezzar to interpret the dream or then to pray with his three friends receive the interpretation at home, give thanks for it, and then return to the court of the emperor. Now notice these words of Nebuchadnezzar to Daniel. In chapter 2, verse 26, Art thou able to make known unto me the dream which I have seen and the interpretation thereof? Are you able to interpret it, Daniel? You're a relative unknown. Can you explain its meaning to me? I don't know. Can you? In Daniel 4, verses 8 and 9, we read this. At the last, Daniel came in before me, whose name was Belteshazzar. Chapter 1, verse 7 tells us that. According to the name of my God, and in whom is the spirit of the holy gods, and before whom I told the dream, saying, O Belteshazzar, master of the magicians. You see, chapter 2, verse 28 tells us that Nebuchadnezzar had earlier made him over all the wise men of Babylon, because I know that the spirit of the holy gods is in thee, and no secret troubleth thee, because in chapter 2, Daniel was able to reveal the secret by the Spirit of God. Now, tell me the visions of my dream that I have seen and the interpretation thereof. He's not saying, can you interpret it, as in chapter 2, when he was a relatively unknown figure. He's the leader of the wise men who has revealed a great secret before in chapter 2. So he asks him, interpret it for me, expecting an answer. Now why am I taking time to compare and contrast these parts of Daniel 2 and Daniel 4? Well, for one thing, I'd like to promote a careful and intelligent reading of the sacred scriptures. God calls his people when we read the Bible, to think. Think. One theologian said that God does not reveal the meaning of his word to a lazy mind. Yet the Bible is clear, objectively clear it is light, but it's not necessarily dead easy. You have to think. It requires mental effort. I want to encourage us all too to compare Scripture with Scripture, especially when Daniel 2, the parts we've been looking at in Daniel 4, are so similar. It invites comparison. You see, God has revealed himself in words in the Bible, and Jesus tells us, search the Scriptures with diligence, with effort, and with prayer. Search the Scriptures. For they are they which testify of me. It's worth also mentioning these things to stress again the unity of the book of Daniel. The 12 chapters of this prophecy are not a mishmash of legends. Now, you didn't believe that they were, and you're quite right too. But there are some people 
who are learned fools who believe they have drivel. They're not regenerate. They hate God and they react against his word. But according to these people, these chapters were later thrown together and then subtly edited by a forger or else he dreamt them up and sucked them out of his own thumb in the second century BC. So the book of Daniel, according to these people, is what Peter says the Gospels are not. Namely, quote, cunningly devised fables. Instead, the book of Daniel is one inspired book. The chapters build upon each other. And the various parts of this book are intrinsically related. That is, later parts build upon presuppose earlier sections and the book itself is noticeable for development development of characters development in the life of Daniel development in revelation and prophecy I've been taking time too in this comparison between chapter 4 and chapter 2 to indicate to you the procedure of Babylonian kings. What does a Babylonian king do when he has a dream that he wants interpreted? Well, he did. He followed the same procedure as is spelled out in Daniel 2 and Daniel 4. And by the way, it's basically the same procedure in Daniel 5 when Belshazzar, who doesn't understand the writing on the wall, follows the same method. That is, what does this mean? What does this mean? Well, then I, as emperor, must ask for the wise men to interpret it. And then, of course, in the biblical narratives here, they fail, and then you go to Daniel. Daniel, he, by the wisdom of God, knows. This is, leave out the Daniel bit now, to, and wind it out to the Babylonian court in general. This is what happened. It's worth mentioning too, to stress a point I made earlier, but to develop it a little, the character of Nebuchadnezzar comes out. He is the same person in chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, chapter 4. He behaves the same way and he responds according to his essential character, a real concrete individual we are not to sum up all these points and to use a phrase I mentioned earlier we are not here reading cunningly devised fables we've got a united book the whole book of Daniel we're comparing and contrasting it it shows us the procedure of dream interpretation followed by Babylonian kings and it shows us what sort of a man Nebuchadnezzar the greatest ruler of the Babylonian Empire was. It was worth pausing to look at these things. This brings us finally to our third point. What's the meaning of this dream? Well, with regard to this dream, more specifically the tree, which looms large in the dream, especially at start, we have the tree's position. It's right bang in the middle of the earth in the dream of Nebuchadnezzar. Besides its position, we have its height, great and tall, one massive tree in the middle of the world. And then we note thirdly its growth, it's going higher and higher and reaching up onto heaven. One great tree, middle of the earth, and it's growing taller. Which leads us to the fourth point made in the narrative about the tree, its visibility. It can be seen all over the earth because it is central and because it is tall and this also draws the eye, growing taller 
and reaching up into the heavens. Makes you even think of the Tower of Babel. Verses 10 and 11. Nebuchadnezzar says, Thus were the visions of my head in my bed. Bed. It's a dream where he slept. Head, he'd been thinking about it. God revealed this to him in his own mind. I saw and behold a tree in the midst of the earth and the height thereof was great. The tree grew and was strong and the height thereof reached unto heaven and the sight thereof to the end of all the earth. Some tree, no other tree could compare to it. It's not as if there were other trees sort of fairly tall and around it. It's as if there's only one tree on the earth as tall going up into heaven and everybody beholds it. What about the foliage and fruit of this tree? It has lovely leaves and abundant fruit to feed all. Verse 12. The leaves thereof were fair, and the fruit thereof much, and in it was meat for all. Is there anything else that we should say about this amazing tree? Well, it provided shade for animals and habitation for birds. Very useful tree. Verse 12 continues, The beasts of the field had shadow under it, and the fowls of the heaven dwelt in the boughs thereof, and all flesh was feathered. What a tree! Mighty, looking lovely, providing food and shade and homes for all. To what or to whom does this tree refer? Well, here's Daniel by divine revelation interpreting it, beginning at verse 20, speaking here to Nebuchadnezzar. The tree that thou sawest, which grew and was strong, whose height reached unto the heaven and the sight thereof to all the earth, whose leaves were fair and the fruit thereof much, and in it was meat for all, under which the beasts of the field dwelt, and upon whose branches the fowls of the heaven had their habitation. He's building it up and mentioning all the amazing features of this tree. Verse 22. It is thou, O king, you, you dreamt about yourself. It is thou, O king, that art grown and become strong, for thy greatness is grown and reacheth unto heaven, and thy dominion to the end of the earth. Nebuchadnezzar is represented by the tree, and these things were all true of him. Beloved, there is another one who is coming in the future of whom these things could be said and could be said in an even more strictly literal sense. We're talking about one who will be far greater than Nebuchadnezzar was some 2,600 years ago. We're talking about one who will be seen by all and not just people who lived in and around the Middle East and not just seen by all but worshipped by all, all around the globe. If Nebuchadnezzar was a big tree growing up into heaven, we're dealing here 
with an even bigger tree that's visible over the whole earth. If Nebuchadnezzar was beautiful and wonderful with attractive foliage, this one, all the world will wonder after him. The Antichrist will provide shelter and housing and food and protection for the entire world. As if the whole world were one great garden of Eden, minus God and righteousness, an earthly paradise without the truth of God and the God of truth, which is actually what the unregenerate in the false churches, in pagan religions, and in our secular society really want. They're crying out when the Christian prays, even so come Lord Jesus. They're saying, oh, if only we had a one great charismatic leader who could give us earthly peace. We'd sell our souls to have them. Yeah, they will. Yeah, they are. Let's read about the Antichrist and his kingdom in parts of Revelation 13. At the end of verse 4, who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? There he is, as we're like Nebuchadnezzar, ruling with peace. He will bring worldwide economic prosperity. Revelation 18, for instance, refers to this, although it refers to God's destroying of his economic prosperity. But with regard to the material comforts, including food, that are found in the anti-Christian kingdom, there is, of course, one very obvious and serious drawback. Namely, that no man might buy or sell, says Revelation 13, verse 17, no man might buy or sell, save he had the mark of the beast, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. And the mark of the beast, which enables people to buy and sell, is intrinsically linked to idolatry, the worship of of the beast through his image. That is, an earthly paradise without God and without righteousness and the terms of entry and enjoyment are worship the beast and take his mark upon you. That's all. Just that. But that's damnation. And in the midst of this, we have Revelation 13, verse 8, open avowal that all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him. And the good news, the hope is this bit, whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. There is an elect people whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. And there is a redeemed people, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb who was slain before the foundation of the world, according to the eternal counsel of God. And then, of course, he was slain in history, in time and space, some 2,000 years ago on the cross, making atonement for all the sins of those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Union with Christ in election and union with Christ in his atoning death and it's the same people who are in the same two categories. It's one category, the people of God, elect and redeemed and of course preserved. And we will be preserved by the grace of God, the grace of God flowing from the cross, a grace given to us in eternal election 
we will preserve from the grace of God so that we will not worship him, so we will not take the mark of the beast, so we will not be included as citizens in the worldwide kingdom. And the calling for the child of God is essentially the one great calling held out to us everywhere in the Bible. Believe. Believe in this crucified, risen Son of God. Believe in the Lamb slain for sins. Believe in your great election in Jesus. Believe in his grace that will keep and preserve you unto the very end. And out of believing, you will persevere. Through faith, you will continue. You'll take up your cross, follow Jesus, and not deny him. One last thing. I've talked about Nebuchadnezzar, this great tree. But I want to point out, before we get there, that Nebuchadnezzar, powerful, mighty, tall tree that he is, he's going to be cut down. And he's going to become like an animal. And the Antichrist, that far greater tree, the Antichrist whom Nebuchadnezzar typifies with a far greater worldwide kingdom, well, when Christ returns, he'll blow on him and he will cast him into the lake of fire forever. Believe that and keep on persevering. Amen. Our Father in heaven, bless to us thy word, that thy word may be quick, powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, and that thy word may comfort and sustain us. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of thy Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen. And for those of you who are looking for a psalm to sing. Mary and I won't sing now. That wouldn't be of much help or edification to you. If you're looking for a psalm to sing, you can sing Psalm 1 or the latter verses of Psalm 92. These are a couple I would recommend because they speak about trees, but the trees here are believers, those who feed on God's word and those who dwell in God's court, who flourish. Thank you.